Honor to have, the, to have today with us uh, by Teams, um, and Professor Alan Coleman from uh, the Department of uh, Cell and Regenerative Biology at uh, Harvard University. Um, Professor Coleman uh, will talk to us about uh, um, the pluripotent stem cells and the cultivated uh, meat production. Um, Professor Coleman, please. Uh, well, hoping you can hear me now. Hello, everybody. Uh, um, thanks to DA for the introduction. And uh, just to point out that, as well as uh, being associated with the department in Harvard, I am acting as an advisor to Aleph Farms, although I will not be s discussing any data from uh, Aleph this talk. Again, I'll be talking about cells and cultivated meat. I will not be talking about cells and coffee. So, just a sec. My first slide shows the current uh, worldwide land uh, meat consumption. Uh, we're about 350 million tons a year of consumption. Our favorite meat is poultry, followed by pork, followed by beef. Mm -hmm. and on the right of my slide, you can see the number of animals that are slaughtered per year to give us this meat, uh, quite considerable, particularly the chickens with nearly 74 billion. Now, in 2013, we can uh, call the advent of a cultivated meat industry. We saw, to great fanfare, Paul uh, Mark Post announced the uh, production of a single burger at a cost of 325,000 uh, and it was made using cultured bovine muscle cells. For many, many reasons, this concept of ultimately replacing the traditional sources of meat with a cultured variety has generated a lot of interest. And today there are over 150 companies uh, focused on making meat. These are shown in the next slide and you can see uh, this commercial landscape taken from the Good Food Institute for uh, uh, the middle of 2023, uh, geographically distributed around the world. And at the top of the slide, you see that uh, in a historic first, two companies, Upside and Good Meat, received US regulatory approval for the sale of chicken cultivated meat. Now, this is an enormous challenge if we wanted to replace all the meat. Uh, we're going from 350 million tons currently, and this meat is essentially 100% of cells, muscle, fat, and connective tissue. Now, there are many benefits from replacing conventional meat, but some of them, particularly those to do with climate change, will only be realized if cultivated meat production is substantial. Now, I've worked out from uh, figures on the production of cells for the uh, biologics, sort of monoclonal antibodies, uh, erythropoietin and other therapeutic proteins, which are mostly made from Chinese hamster ovary cells, that the whole industry in the world used about, or produced about 500 tons in 2022. This is based on assumptions I have at the bottom of, of the slide, and if cultivated meat contained 100% or 20% or 3% cell content, we would need to make 350, 70, or 10.5 million tons of cells each year, respectively, to replace natural meat. So this would incry, uh, necessitate an expansion of infrastructure from 20,000 to 700,000 times production levels at the moment. Now, the current workflow making cultivated meat is very, well, quite simple. We have cell banks, and I, I show you PSC, that's pluripotent stem cells, adult stem cells, and immortalized cells, which I'll talk about in another slide. Uh, you have the banks, you thaw them out, you grow them in two dimensions, and then you put them into bioreactors to expand. Then if you want to differentiate at the end into muscle or adipose tissue, connective tissue, you have differentiation bioreactors, and then seeding on scaffolds uh, already made, or cell printing with scaffold material if you want to make cuts of meat, like T-bone steaks, etc. Or if you want to get uh, burgers or sausages, you'd have 
cells in edible microcarriers with glue and, and plant powder. Now, what's the eight characteristics of an ideal cell type for this process? Well, you want cells that double rapidly, unlimited replication, grow at high density, and have cheap media. All these things are linked, particularly the high density and the cheap media, because the media is a major expense, and if you can grow cells at higher density, you will economize on media use. The cell source should be easy to uh, find and prepare, should be genetically and phenotypically stable, and retain an ability to differentiate to desired lineages. And ideally, no gene gene manipulation should be used. Now, what are the available cell types? Well, I'm just looking at cows here, and you have embryonic stem cells, which I talked about this morning, are made from early embryos, and these are pluripotent cells, which can give rise to all the cells in the adult body. And then you've got induced pluripotent stem cells, which have the same properties, they're pluripotent also, but they're made by taking cells from the adult, usually, skin biopsy, something like that, and adding uh, 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 transcription factor genes and reprogramming these cells into the same type of cell as an ES cell. Then you have uh, adult stem cells, so if you take a muscle biopsy, that muscle biopsy has bovine, if it's from a cow, satellite cells, and they can be used, uh, expanded, and puri you can purify muscle or fat progenitors and expand them in bioreactors, as you saw in earlier talks. Or you can take cell lines, which are uh, usually spontaneously immortalized, which can uh, then uh, grow and you could use genetic manipulation if you need to change them into certain lineages. Uh, uh, but sometimes they'll go into other lineages, as you'll see on my last slide, uh, without genetic manipulation. So these are the four cell types, four cell types that, that are used in these processes. So what are the key attributes of these various uh, cells? Well, if we look at the ES cells and the IPS, pretty much the same, they give an unlimited expansion, and in a calculation I've done, you can see that just from one cell bank, you can make 20 times 10 to the 12 tons of meat, which is thousands of times more than the current annual consumption. Uh, they grow in aggregate suspension, uh, pluripotent, similar with IPC, Adult cells are easier to access. Uh, no gene, gene manipulation is used in their uh, uh, access, whereas with IPS you have to use genetic manipulation, that's why it's shown in red. Uh, and with immortalized cell lines, they show as a benefit unlimited expansion, single cell suspension, which uh, uh, facilitates more rapid growth and higher density growth. And when we look at the disadvantages of the various uh, cells. All cells have disadvantages, and probably the greatest disadvantage is the adult stem cell, which at the moment, and this can all change, show limited and slow proliferation uh, and prompting repeated animal samplings, which puts quite a lot of people off this concept. And they do not grow, as far as I know, in suspension, although they, they will grow on, on uh, micro beads. Now, uh, one comment here, irrespective of the starting material, uh, starting uh, cell choice, you can use genetic manipulation to either accelerate or initiate the dissuasion process, which in muscle formation, some people add MyoD gene to facilitate muscle differentiation. And for immortalization of, say, fibroblasts, they use the TERF gene. Now, what are the company choices? So this is a slide I've compiled. It was shown last month by Tom Phillips in Roslyn Technologies uh, from Scotland, and he uh, kindly gave me the uh, consent to, to show his slide. And he, he looked at the 20 biggest cultivated meat companies, various types of meat, and these are the cell types being used by these companies. And you see there's a mixture of embryonic stem cells, IPS cells, immortalized cells. He only cites one doing primary cells, which I suppose is most of meat, but I'm not sure. And, and, and this is the, uh, uh, what's going on at the moment. Now, my last um, data slide is this paper that was uh, published in 2022, which I think puts
puts the cat amongst the, kid, uh, the chickens, as I would say. It was uh, it's an Israeli publication from Jerusalem by Pasitka et al. and was published in Nature Foods. What they did was take culture, uh, they, they put fibroblasts from a chicken embryo into culture uh, uh, and they, they got spontaneous uh, uh, cells growing and then they added plant lecithin, it's a mixture of uh, molecules which cause the differentiation of the fibroblasts into fat cells, or diposites. So they made cultured fat, which they then added to textured protein, which came from soybean, and made cultured chicken. And so these were spontaneously morphalized, they used very cheap media, the population doublings were enormous of this cell line, doubling time very fast, they're genetically stable but abnormal genetics, don't cause tumors in chickens, and they were easily converted. And then they did a blind tasting, comparing breasts made from soybean and their fat cells with farm-bred uh, chicken breasts. And uh, the blind tastings showed that 85% of the people said they would eat this type of uh, meat if it was available, which really surprised me, because intuitively I thought that you really need muscle if you're going to make uh, cultivated meat. But this says, seems to say otherwise, although this was chicken. So my conclusions are that PSCs for uh, pluripotent stem cells fulfill many, though not yet all, of the desired attributes of an ideal cell, and to a greater degree than adult stem cells and immortalized cells. So I show in green, yet again, the advantages of PSCs, but in red, some of the limitations uh, at the moment. Uh, with ESC not being genetically manipulated, but IPSC are all genetically manipulated to get them in the first place. Now the results of Pasitka et al. using chicken fibroblasts derived fat cells, to me, will prompt a, a re-examination of the premise, which I had, that differentiated muscle cells will be essential to a successful meat product. The adipocytes clearly confer taste and aroma qualities to this product, and an answered question is whether increasing the percentage of cells, and they, uh, we estimate, have about 3 to 10% cells in that final product, will further improve this and other products, and if so, what further cell types will be best? Will even undifferentiated cells, like PSCs and IPS cells, suffice instead of having to differentiate the cells into muscle cells. So that's my last slide. My penultimate slide now is, thank you, but if I have time, I just want to dwell on this one slide, it will be one minute, Didier, I hope you give me the time, on the real origins of cultivated meat. I said the advent was in 2013, but something uh, Winston Churchill, uh, who, who uh, in 1931, made the following statement in an essay that we shall challenge the absurdity of growing a whole chicken in order to eat the breast or wing by growing these parts separately under a suitable medium. In saying this, he was influenced by Alexis Carroll, who won the Nobel Prize in uh, 1912 for introducing micro-suturing into surgery and also cultured the same chicken embryo part uh, for 20 years in culture, that was the uh, assertion, no one believes that was true, uh, but I mention this because for me this was very interesting because I was involved in uh, the cloning of the first uh, set of pigs and we cloned these pigs to make uh, uh, pigs for organ transplantation and we named two of them after Alexis Carroll, uh, Alexis and uh, Carroll as you see here, and it was only in year 2000 when we published this work that a, a French embryologist rang me up to ask me to change the names of these pigs from Alexis Carroll to Marion Curie because he said that Alexis Carroll was, not, was an anti-Semite and a fascist and that boulevards in France were being renamed uh, uh, and his name was being expunged from the, uh, the register. So... Uh, that's the end of my talk, but I, I was fascinated by this uh, voyage into the history 
of the real origins of cultivating 